so nearby Brad and Nisha is the last video before Christmas. Do you want to talk about a Muppet's Christmas Carol? Yay! Oh, space needs to do that. Whoa! Again, we're Marley and Marley. Whoa! Oh, it's such a good movie. We've got to do my intro before we can talk about Kermit the Frog. I love Kermit, it's so good. For a lot of people, it's not Christmas until Michael Caine has stormed his way through what many people consider to be the quintessential adaptation of Charles Dickens' classic Christmas chronicle, A Christmas Carol. Wait a second, you're not Charles Dickens. There's a few movies I always watch at Christmas time. One is this, the other one is The Wrong Trousers. Because for me, it's not Christmas until Feathers McGraw goes, Boom. The moment it lands inside that milk, I don't know, it's not a Christmas movie really, is it? It's not set at Christmas, but it feels very Christmas because it's always shown on Christmas morning. Like, I feel like you wake up on Christmas morning and they always play like an Aardman animation short on TV and it's like, I just love wait, watching Feathers McGraw and that noise of... That little pitter patter of Feathers McGraw walking always cracks me up. I'm surprised that Wallace and Gromit have not done a full Christmas shot. Like they've done one of the cracking contraptions was them doing a Christmas card. Yep. And I think a snowman as well. It just, they just feel very Christmassy to me because I just watch them at Christmas. It's the same thing with like, um, uh, like Chicken Run and stuff. They always seem to show those movies around Christmas time. Oh, is that we off on holiday? I think it's it's like a cosy British thing, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. They show you the, the cosiest of the British thing. And that's kind of the theme of today's video. So folks at home, let us know like, you know, what thing you watch on like TV or Netflix to make you feel Christmassy. Santa's coming in town. Santa! Getting back to A Christmas Carol, Michael Caine reportedly only appeared in the movie, so his at the time seven-year-old daughter could have something to watch starring him where he didn't try and hurt someone with a shotgun. Take me back to London. Inception came out too late. The thing is, I don't want my kid to watch that because it sucks. Like, I think we've gone long enough now where Inception was a gimmick, and the gimmick's not very good. The, the visuals are fantastic. The visuals are fantastic. I love that they actually blew up that restaurant in like um, Leonardo DiCaprio's face. I love that behind-the-scenes shot of Leonardo DiCaprio going, because they blew up an actual like cafe with him in it. I must admit, when we did shoot it, it seemed a lot different having Leo and Ellen in amongst that whole explosion. They were in their own little safety area where even the paper cup on the table didn't move. But have you guys had a thought about you know your Christmas traditions in regards to the media that you'd watch? Because another one for me is the bottom Christmas special. Because I don't think anything sums up a crap British Christmas more than that Christmas special. Specifically the part where they're making Christmas dinner and like <laughs> Richie's just going through all the things he's gonna have for Christmas dinner. He's like, we've got have the sprouts. And Eddie's like, oh, why do we have sprouts? And he goes, well, do you like sprouts? Like, no. He's like, so why are we having them? Because it's Christmas! <laughs> it's just, that's the thing is, because it's Christmas. Will you stop whinging, Eddie? Nobody likes sprouts. <laughs> then why are we having them then? Because it's Christmas! <laughs> yeah, well, for me, like, it's not Christmas until I see that Coca-Cola advert with the oh, lorry. Yes. But I think they've changed it this year because <gasps> there was a Coca-Cola advert and it wasn't the lorry and I was like, it's not the one where it's like the, the holidays are coming. Yeah, that that just to me, because it's really old, it's a really old advert, gives me that nostalgia of Christmas. Yeah, and you know, for anyone from America, I don't think they have it in America. Like, here's the advert we're talking about. And then I think the other one is like, the other game people play is Whamageddon. Oh, yeah. Okay. I'm still in. I'm still in. It. Okay, so you lost one again. So again, for Americans maybe don't aren't familiar with the work of the late, great George Michael, there is just a, a game people play at Christmas in Britain called Whamageddon, where you've got to try and go as long as you can through the month of December without hearing Wham's Last Christmas. Here's a clip. So, so everyone... No, do not. No, Lucas, do not do it. It's not fair. So everyone loses Wham again. But no, I, I nearly went to Wham Haller over the weekend. I was at a karaoke bar and I heard the introduction. That's the one, yeah. Is that what they call karaoke Wham Haller? My ears perked up, but as they started playing, it was a remix and remixes do not remixes count. Remixes do not it count. It has yeah. to be the original. So when I heard those first bars, I was like, I'm gone. I'm entering. What Those Wham, those wham curries are coming for me to take me to Wham Haller. <laughs> and it's become this like beloved Christmas tradition, albeit a very silly one. And you've seen that every year, people take it more and more seriously to the point there was a DJ who nearly got in a fight for playing it because he played it in a club not realising people were playing it because he had no idea what it was. And a bunch of people went up and started giving him shit and he nearly started throwing hands. <laughs> The flight for playing Last Christmas by Wham. See, I had my niece running point for me. I was like, if it comes on, you skip it. You don't tell me. 
She did it once. I got away. Yeah. But any more Christmas traditions for you too? Because I say ultimately this is just a video to talk about Christmas traditions and a Muppets Christmas Carol. Well, for me, one of the biggest traditions is watching a Muppets Christmas Carol it's because so my mum is obsessed with the film. It's, it's so good. Like my mum had the VHS and. It was the only version where they had the missing song. Ah, the missing song that was too sad. Yeah, the romantic song that was too sad for children. Mm -hmm. They cut that song out of the the like the DVD releases, and until recently, they hadn't found the reels to remaster it. Yes, it recently yeah. showed up, and it's now. If people are curious, it's on Disney Plus. You can select an option on Disney Plus to watch it with the original cut song. Cause it originally played during the credits, and then it still needs to be too sad for that, so it was cut entirely. And there's something similar with another film I always tend to watch around Christmas time: um, Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. Again, not a Christmas movie, but it makes me feel Christmassy. Because it's like, the beginning's really cold. And you've got a little Charlie Bucket wandering around. He's like, staring through the, the candy shop window. As the candy man's like, sorry, you're too poor to come in. Whoa! <laughs> candy everywhere. <laughs> but I always feel very Christmassy in that. And there is a song that people don't even know is in that movie. Where it's like, his mum's song. But it's cut from almost every theatrical DVD and like television airing. Because the content of the song is basically, don't have dreams. Because it's just oh, his mum singing great. about, like, you know, accept your lot in life. Sometimes it's shit. Don't have dreams, Charlie. <laughs> Cheer up, Charlie. So uh, they always cut that song out of most, like, airings of the, sh the film. Because it's just really sad. <laughs> it's just basically this really downtrodden woman singing about how you don't have dreams. <laughs> anyway, bring it back to Michael Caine. Very specifically, he wanted to appear in A Muppet's Christmas Carol. Because at the time, his then seven-year-old daughter... Didn't really know what he did for a living because he explained, I'm an actor. It's like, what's an actor, daddy? And it's like, well, you see people on TV, I do that. It's like, oh, can I see you in anything you've been in? It's like, not really, no. So to remedy this, Michael Caine has asked his agent, um, just... I want to be in a child-friendly film, so you know, put your ear to the ground. If there's anything kid-friendly, I want to be involved. And well, actually, they're looking for someone to play Scrooge in an adaptation of A Christmas Carol, and you'll be standing alongside some of the most celebrated, famous actors working in Hollywood today. It was only later that Michael Caine learned that these like celebrated thespians, these you know veterans of the stage, were made of felt. No, oh, no, no, that's a frog's no. idea. <laughs> and that's the thing as well, like, I'm saying this like with my tongue in my cheek, but I, I do consider the Muppets to be actors and the people who work on the Muppets, like Frank Oz, like one of the most famous puppeteers who's left from those original like Jim Henson days, and said like, they're not puppets, they're characters and they're actors. And one of the things that Jim Henson was always a big proponent of is the idea of puppetry being an art form. It's not for children. You can like, obviously children enjoy them, but you can make puppet centered entertainment for adults and that's what the Muppets are always and that's why the Muppets are so beloved because it's that entertainment that can be watched and enjoyed by children but adults watch it and don't get bored so there's jokes and stuff for them what might I put you down for nothing you wish to remain anonymous I wish to be left alone what was that, what was that film that came out not too long ago which was a mix of puppets and adults but it was very adult themed yeah so which I oh, yeah I didn't like that one because it leaned too hard into it it was like a detective thing yeah and there's like violence and stuff in it which I thought that's pushing it too far the thing that made the Muppets so good it's like the Simpsons where it rides that line of it's never too close to the knuckle and there's some risque jokes in there but ultimately it's innocent like and one of the things I love is that everyone just respects the Muppets. There's, I've done a lot of research for this video, like watching interviews with the Muppets in character. And there's not a single actor I could find who doesn't love working with the Muppets. And something they all say as well is, is that you think it'd be really distracting working with a Muppet. But the moment you see those, like, you know, those fuzzy lips move, you immediately forget there's a guy there with his hand up his ass. <laughs> There could literally be somebody in front of you holding it, yep. talking, and you look at the Muppet. Yep. The Muppet is talking. There's a couple of like famous interviews with Jim Henson when he's holding Kermit. And he's just sat there holding. You can see that he's got his hand up Kermit's ass. You can see where... And the, the, but the moment he starts articulating Kermit, everyone's attention just turns to Kermit. And Jim Henson himself has said, well, I can sit here and do this because I know that the talking frog is more interesting. Your attention will be naturally drawn to the talking frog. And then Kermit's like... Which is one of my favourite things Kermit does. I love when Kermit like smushes his face and goes... I love the Kermit memes you get. Oh god, they're so good. Where it's like, um, that one where he's looking at other Kermit, like dark Kermit. He's just like, <laughs> don't just, do it. Just forbidden Kermit. Like, that's like the one of him, it's like when he nods like this, when he goes... 
<laughs> and there's that great like a uh, shit post of when Christian Bale does it. They put on both sides, just like Christian Bale and Kermit having a conversation of. <laughs> I'm I'm so gutted. I didn't bring my Kermit. Oh, you've got a Kermit, haven't you? I've got a Kermit. Can, you, can anyone do the voice? I can't do the voice. I, I can do it badly. It That's the thing. The, I think the, the current voice actor for Kermit can do it badly. Because <laughs> there's a new voice actor and he sucks. It's not Kermit. Yeah, you, people can do like a, a vague facsimile, but it's the actual Kermit voice. Like it takes a lot of. It's like really far out the back of your throat. It's so famous as well that no one can ever do it without exaggerating it. Which is something we talked about with like Billy West, isn't it? Where his natural speaking voice is the voice of Fry. So he says that I'll never lose my job because no one can ever do Fry like I can because they always just they always exaggerate it a little bit. And it's you, the same thing you with can Kermit. Hear his age though in the new episode. Yeah, same with Marge. You watch any recent episode of The Simpsons and Marge sounds like a mum. My kids packed mine as a special treat for my first day. You gonna do a Kermit for us, Brad? Because the closest <laughs> one I can do is just quoting that. I'll tell the story that I was up, as I often am, like three or four in the morning with a few friends watching YouTube videos and just doing it's just on and it's random stuff and you're just letting it play, you're letting it play. And just this random compilation of like VR chat memes came on and I looked at my, like, is this really what we're doing? And we just watched, we're just like, fine, I don't want to turn it over because I think the control almost died. And this one just Kermit comes on and like, hello, what's up, baby? And then just the Kermit, like, I can't do when the Kermit runs off the edge of like just the sky and he goes, I'm going to Kermit suicide. And it just, I fucking lost it. But just the idea of like Kermit, this tiny little VR Kermit just sprinting. He goes, I'm going to Kermit suicide. And just leaps off the edge and it fucking sent my sides into orbit. I am going to Kermit suicide. You're going to do your Kermit? I did mine. <laughs> <laughs> On the spot now. I'll do a... Uh... Whenever you find love, it feels like Christmas. Bring it back to Michael Caine. He similarly, like other actors who work with the Muppets, was like, I'm going to treat this very seriously. And he famously stated when he was asked by, like, you know, the Jim Henson company, so, so how do you want to play Scrooge? I'm going to play it like a real play. I'm going to play it, and I quote, like I'm working with members of the Royal Shakespeare Company. Yeah. And that's one of the things people love about this film, is that Michael Caine is so serious. Like, he never drops that facade. And apparently it was really difficult because obviously the Muppets are really funny. And, like, the actors who play the Muppets ad-lib a lot. And they also, as well, like, real actors, do they mess up their lines but stay in character? So there's loads of, like, behind-the-scenes stuff of, like, Michael Caine just creasing at the Muppets. And it's really fun. But, like, he plays it as serious as a heart attack. I, Ebenezer Scrooge, would I do a thing like that? No. I mean, yes, but but you did. Bob Cratchit, I've had my fill of this. There's a lot of um, situations, a lot of uh, those stories of actors, like serious actors, doing ro comedy roles. Like, Leslie Olsen's obviously the best example. But yes. It, it works so well. Like, you have those... Very staid actors. Like, was who... it the Ricky Gervais extras, where they got, like, Patrick Stewart, Patrick Stewart and Stewart, yeah, and he's Liam Neeson to do... And then all the clothes fall off. Yeah, and all of them are exceptionally funny, because these people are so straight-talking. Yes, and, like, that's what Michael Caine said. He went, when they asked him, like, why do you want to play it so seriously? He went, well, the more serious I play it, the funny the Muppets look in comparison. And his way of, re like, in the way he put it quite poetically is, I'll be the rock that the Muppets bounce off of. And I just, I just love that, and that's why you get some of the best moments in the film, where it's just, like, him being, like, yelling at his rats. <laughs> I love his accountant rats. He's the accountant rats. And one of my favourite details was them there, like, tick, 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 and just, like, how would they like to work on the unemployment line? And all the rats just start dancing. Our assets are frozen. How would the bookkeepers like to be suddenly... Unemployed! He he this is my island in the sun. It's so good. Well, like one of the the harshest lines, like from the original book that made it in, is yeah. the one that um, I, sh I showered it earlier. It's like the people say, "Oh, these kids are going to die. These people are going to die." It's like then they best make them get on with it to decrease the surplus population. And that's one of the things that makes it so good. And the fact is, like when he's talking to like, the spirits, he's talking to the spirits, and like again, he plays it so seriously. Like you know, the little. The ghost of um, Christmas past comes in. It's like, but you're just a child. And because he's taking it so seriously, you get drawn in the same way he did. And I guess I've got to tell one more story about the Muppets because I forgot to mention it earlier and it's a very fun one. It's very, it's very, it's not so much fun as it is like heartwarming. And it is Danny Trejo. We all know Danny Trejo, right? Hardened, badass Danny Trejo. Former, like, San Quentin prison member for armed robbery, Danny Trejo. He was doing like um, a bit with the Muppets, and then he found out that um, I think it was his mother had died. And obviously, Danny Trejo, people came up to him like, "You're right, Danny." He's like, "Yeah, yeah, I'm good, I'm good." But then Kermit came over and said, "I'm sorry about your mum," and he just started crying and hugged Kermit. Oh. That's the power of the, the puppet. 
Even Danny Trejo broke down. I like that it's similar, you know, if you're working on a kid's show and you have like mascots like Barney the Dinosaur. Just... <laughs> I love you, you love me. Everyone can do that voice, that one's terrible. Like you don't see them as a person in the costume, you see them as Barney. Yeah. Is Barney, everyone loves Barney. Well, I want that. No one, everyone hates Barney. I couldn't stand Barney to I would, I, I would absolutely just like, you know, just wallop Barney once. It's like the tweenies. If I, I, I would drop kick every member of the tweenies one by one. What about Bear in the Big Blue House? I hated the Bear in the Big Blue The only <laughs> one that I like any kids I like bananas in pyjamas. Oh, I didn't like them. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. And bring it back to a Muppets Christmas Carol. It is widely considered to be one of the most accurate adaptations of that story. And while there are many, many adaptations of A Christmas Carol, some more direct than others, some just take the, the overall themes or, you know, the ideas from it and just use those. Eugene? Yes. A ghost! Others are more direct, there's been like stage plays and stuff like that. The Muppets Christmas Carol seems to be one of the most accurate because they barely changed anything from the original story, say for putting some Muppets in and then like truncating some aspects to get down to a lean 90 minutes. One thing I will give it credit for is the bit at the end with the Ghost of the Christmas Future. Yes. Terrifying. Like, as a kid... A... <laughs> I'm coughing because I've just, it's too much. I've got, some, <laughs> I've got hot chocolates at Christmas. As a kid, that scene terrified me because it's not even like, it's not even a normal Grim Reaper. Like, no, it it's, looks it's like, like all those, weird and... Yeah, it looks like the statue you would see on like a grave site. Yeah, which is what its inspiration was, yes. Is it as creepy as the one from the 1969 one though, the animated one, that I always bring up? Mm -hmm. Ghost of the Future, I fear you more than any spectre I have seen before. The Ghost of Christmas Pass is absolutely terrifying. Yeah. But also um, the future one, which is also Grim Reaper, is still just as terrifying. But because of how, how it's animated, because it's quite an old animation, it's just so dark. Yeah, it's got that weird edge. That's and the thing of like, yeah. It's traumatizing, to be fair. Because it's a story that lends itself very much to uh, exaggeration and like parody, which is why it's so famously been parodied and adapted so many times. Like, I still think like, The Simpsons are one of the funniest ones, where they, they do a meta commentary on the fact it's been parodied so much. Come on, death. Leave my groom alone. Take Tiny Jim. Where it's like, all love by Al. And the groom is like, no, all idiot. All <laughs> love by Al. No! And not by all! No! And Bart tells him, no, like, you know, they've been milking that for years. And it's the Star Trek one, where it's like, Sir, there seems to be three ghosts off the cyborg <laughs> It's just like the three ghosts outside, and like William Shatner's like, Oh no, I see my future! I'm so fat! Captain, there appears to be some sort of spirit from an Earth holiday past. Mr. Scott, fire photon torpedoes! Alright, discounting Muppets Christmas Carol, and what is your favourite adaptation? Uh, the stage play. I'm not sure which one I watched, but I watched the stage play version of it when I was younger, and I always found that to be very good. Because it's like, you know, it's very theatrical. It's a very theatrical story, and it's like, it's got a lot of memorable elements. It's one of those stories where, even if you've not seen it, you know the bits. It's basically like, it's about as close as you can get to a pantomime, without it being a pantomime. Maybe I watched the pantomime that I know, because I know I yelled a lot at the, um, at the thing. It's behind you! Oh, my, uh, thing is though, a pantomime version of Christmas Carol would be amazing. Of like, oh, there's no ghosts here. Yes, there is! <laughs> But yeah, it's uh, apparently it's one of the most uh, faithful adaptations of the story ever told. Save for the fact it's got some Muppets in there. <laughs> Even the, some of the stuff they change is only for the sake of like making the adaptation like a bit more faithful. Like they have Charles Dickens as like the narrator, uh, played by Gonzo, and that like, Rizzo the Rat as his assistant, and they use lines from the book. And it's that makes you realize, like, man, Charles Dickens was good. He was so good when they're describing like Scrooge. It's like he was a cold, dark man. I was like, you know, as cold and dark as Flint. And when they're talking about when he's going up his stairs and it's like, you know, he was like, you know, as, a, as private as an oyster. It's like those like turns of phrase that are like so like evocative and like, you know, just, oh, they're so good. And like, you know, they feel, they sound amazing coming out of like just Gonzo. He was as angry as blowing the bloody doors off. You're only supposed to blow the bloody doors off. <laughs> well, there is a reference to uh, Michael Caine's career, kind of, in The Muppet's Christmas Carol. When he's going down the street doing, doing the song, where he's like doing the little... My first Michael Caine's first singing role as well, by the way. He was very proud of that. And when they asked him, like, did you know you could sing? I went, no, I know I couldn't sing very well, but I thought, well, no one's going to care because I'm in the Muppets. 
And then Muppets ended up being quite good singers as well. <laughs> so I guess, well, you see, he's trying. I guess it fits the character. That Scoogey's kind of trying a little bit. That's the um, Hello, Mr. Hum. Yes. That one. <laughs> but as he's walking down the street, he goes past a shop that's called Mickle Flights, which is uh, Michael Caine's original name. And we did a video before about how Michael Caine's name was like Maurice Micklethwaite. And then he changed his name to Michael Caine legally because he'd go to like passport control when he's traveling. And he's like, all right, Michael Caine. And he'd get his passport and go, who's this Maurice guy then? He'd go, that's me. I'm an actor. Actors change their names. Like, well, I don't know. You're Michael Caine, aren't you? So he ch- legally changed his name to Michael Caine. So before we started filming, you happened to mention that there's a pub quiz question. Yes. So yeah. there is a... Since you're talking about Christmas Carol, we mentioned Whamageddon and people getting angry and fighting in pubs. There is a pub quiz question that causes arguments at pub quizzes around the country each and every Christmas time. And the question is, how many ghosts is Scrooge visited by in the Christmas Carol? Four. Yes, that is the correct answer because the ghost that the ghost of his um, uh, former colleague who tells him about the three ghosts that are going to visit him. And every year there are pub quizzes up and down the country that ask this question they put their answer as three, and then people who actually remember and have read or watched any adaptation of the story go, no, it's four. He's visited by three Christmas spirits, but he's specifically visited by four ghosts. Yeah. And that's the thing, apparently, in pub quizzes up and down the country, that's an argument every year. Because, like, you know, you'll get the pub quizzes trying to put it in. They're like, oh, how many? Because you think it's an easy question. And they're like, oh, it's four. Like, no, it's not. It's three. You're like, ghost of Christmas past, future and present. It's like, but what about the ghost that tells him about those ghosts? And like, Oh, yeah. Well, if it's Mobbit's Christmas Carol, it's five. Because it was, there was Jacob two. and Marley's were two of them. Yeah, that's, Marley and Marley. that's another change they made. <laughs> it's so good. <laughs> Any more Christmas traditions for you guys? Anything you like to do around Christmas time? Anything that makes you feel especially Christmassy? And don't say watch Die Hard, people in the comments. That's such a boring answer. Well, it's not a film. I don't know if it's... Christmassy, mm-hmm. but it's always something that gets me excited on Christmas Day is watching um, EastEnders. <laughs> oh, you need you need to know who died in EastEnders. Yeah, someone is like because they've been building up to it this year. Okay, someone is gonna die this Christmas. Someone dies every Christmas. Context for Americans: British soaps. There's three big ones. There's Emmerdale, there's Coronation Street, and there's EastEnders. Yeah. And around Christmas time. They always have to, like, you know, get the big... So, you know, everyone's going to be at home, sat at home Christmas Day with their tea and, like, you know, a few, like, chocolates out of the tin, like, watching it. So they need to get bigger and bigger storylines every year. And it's become a running joke that just why do people celebrate Christmas in these places? Because someone always dies. Why do people think, live there? You know, one year they had a train crash that killed 14 characters in one of the one of the soaps. Yeah. They always compete with each other as well. It's yeah. like if, if one soap has, like, um, an establishment set on fire... And the other soap has to have set something on fire as well. They've always got to like out, you know, dramatise each other. It's like, how much do you think it costs to insure the Queen Vic after every time that place is burnt down? <laughs> or, or the number of people that have fallen off the roof. Like, health and safety just shut that down. Oh, that well, looks... well, doesn't it? Was it Max has had two of his children fall off the same roof and die? Three. Three. <laughs> <laughs> they, have they ever done like a Christmas carol with Phil Mitchell? <laughs> <laughs> they couldn't do that, couldn't they? Bonnie. Oh. It's crack. People love Phil Mitchell. I love Steve McFadden. The fact that all he does, he just get pissed and go dogging. It's like, what a legend. <laughs> what an absolute legend. Like, imagine, like, you know, you're having sex with your missus and then you see the wind and just Phil Mitchell. <laughs> You'd lose your mind. I want, I want some crack. Yeah, I mean, literally. <laughs> any, any more questions for you, Brad? Uh, I always like watching uh, Black Adder's Christmas Carol. Black Adder's Christmas Carol, for me, is one of the funniest adaptations. It's a really good one, yeah, because it's an yeah. it's, um, inversion of it, isn't it, where it's like he's a nice guy at first and he turns into an asshole. Yeah, but like the, the, it's such a reach to get him there, where like uh, I, uh, Hagrid, fucking um, Robbie Coltrane, mm-hmm. basically dressed as Hagrid and looks like Hagrid. Mm-hmm. That's why I call him Hagrid. He looks like exactly the same. Yeah. He wanders in accidentally and he's like, oh, your ancestors were arseholes. And he's like, really? Show me. And then they do flashbacks they to the other Blackadder they... series. Heavens, is that the time I really must be off? I'd love to see Christmas future. No, 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 no. It's terribly melodramatic. Well, that's one of the things I love about Blackadder as well, because it's, again, British sitcom. People aren't familiar with it right, in America. And it notably has some of the best, like, just portrayals of actual historical figures, like... Uh, Miranda Richardson as um, Queen Elizabeth. It's like one of the most realistic because she just played her as a, a petulant, spoiled child, which is how she acted with her court. And then they have like um, uh, the Duke of Wellington played by Stephen Fry, 
one of the most realistic like portrayals of the Duke of Wellington, who was a raging asshole. So Stephen Fry played him as a raging asshole, just kicks servants up the arse. <laughs> yeah, and it's like I just love that. And yeah, it's very Christmassy. Similar to me, I always watch like Only Fools and Horses. I always feels very Christmassy when I'm watching Only Fools and Horses, especially the to Hull and Back episode because they go to Yorkshire and you have like um, David Jason just been like. I'm going to be raising whippets and wearing flat caps before you know it and saying, hey, up. And he's like, hey, calm down, David Jason. Calm down. And the camera has died, so this has been fading out to black. We should always um, take the message of A Christmas Carol to heart of um, scaring the fuck out of millionaires to show him what they've got. 